picture. Are you? Yeah, we're seeing you talk, and now me talk, sort of. Oh, you should see the slides on that page. At least you should be. I got a big bar around it. You got nothing. You got nothing. All right, let's try this page. Let's try this one. Uh, let's try this. Let's see if that makes any difference. Share. Hey, we see your email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So you see that page, but you're not seeing. All right, how about that one? That's better. All right, I'm going to go to full screen, see if it stays there. Yep, there you All go. Right. Weird. That's how it was before. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Goff. I'm a principal security engineer with NCC Group. I'm also the founder of Malware Archaeology, the famous cheat sheet location, and IMF Security, where LogMD is. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, these cheat sheets are, are definitely useful, so please uh, take a gander at a minimum. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about them, but uh, I am a Blue Team Defender Ninja, Malware Archaeologist, uh, Logaholic, and I do work for NCC Group now. And I love properly configured logs, so they tell us who, what, where, when, and hopefully how an attack occurred or what somebody might have done. So some background. Uh, I used to work for a video game company that got badly pwned by the Chinese group WinNTI. Uh, Kaspersky did a report, uh, WinNTI more than just a game, if you wanna read kind of on the background of that time frame attack. There's been several other reports written by WinNTI group, uh, well-known Chinese hacking team, and uh, I had to deal with them for uh, almost five years at two different stints at a gaming company. And the interesting thing is they got by all of our security tools, um, like often the red teams do. I, I work with a bunch of red teamers there in the Austin office at NCC, and uh, I'm constantly hearing the interesting ways they get around things. And so uh, the goal here is, you know, what did we learn and how do we catch them? Uh, whether it's WinNTI group or red teams, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. I thought this was interesting. Recently, I was asked by an IR consulting firm, not the one I work for, but another one, uh, with all the organizations I deal with from not only consultant, but also prior in healthcare and all the acquisitions that we did through that healthcare company, um, are, they, are any of them mature? And, you know, I thought about that. I'm like, huh, are any of them mature? And I, sadly, uh, no, was, was my reply. And to me, you know, if you've heard my top 10, there's really only three tools in my top 10 of, of security tools, and really none of them are security tools, except maybe LogMD uh, with log management and a tool like BigFix. Um, maturity to me means that you have to be very repeatable. You have to do a lot of basics, and your tools really have to exceed what you expected them to do, which is why log management and BigFix uh, exceeded the expectations because a lot of people just use it to view logs, manage logs, whereas we literally caught the Chinese Win NTI team with, with Splunk and, and all the logging we had turned on. And BigFix gave us the ability because it's a configuration management patching tool, it exceeded our expectations because it was actually used to, again, create additional alerts, uh, launch our remediation efforts and, and clean up the environment, something the tool was not designed for. So for me, maturity means uh, you really are doing above and beyond the bar. And so uh, sadly, no, none of the acquisitions I've been involved with would be anywhere near that bar. Uh, even the, the large organization I worked for, I think, fell short of the bar. And definitely organizations I've worked with in consulting over the years, uh, even back when I was at HP, uh, um, definitely uh, know if they're not mature. It, it's pretty rare to run into somebody who was really, really mature, uh, which is, you know, sadly, uh, really sad. They buy a lot of stuff, right? Think prevention works, the, the shiny blinky blue lights. Uh, but they lack security one-on-one, -on -one, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the basics that they already have, which is really kind of the interesting aspect of it. So prevention versus reduction. Um, I'm not, I, I do not like the word prevention. I wish in security we would stop using it. Um, I believe actions we take can be preventative, but uh, if prevention worked, then why are we all here learning? Uh, why are we still buying security solutions? If prevention worked, we'd have the problem solved by now. And we're, you know, decades into this security problem. Our, our, our teams are bigger. The product suites are, are larger. The problems are, are wider. I'm still shocked at how many people have problems with uh, 
with uh, ransomware, and we're going to touch a little bit about that in the course of the presentation. But reduction is more realistic because when we talk about our security programs, you know, what we're doing is we're reducing our likelihood of an incident, right? We install a tool that may have preventative capabilities. We're reducing our likelihood of an incident. We install AV, we're reducing the likelihood of an incident. We harden something, we reduce the likelihood of something happen, right? We reduce the attack surface. So we put in WAFs, firewalls, uh, block rules, you know, uh, domain blocking. We put in IP blocks from various countries, et cetera, right? We're reducing the attack surface that people can get into and take advantage of or exploit. We can also reduce the amount of time it takes to investigate, investigate, you know, gotta fix that, investigate an incident. Thus why we are here. Preparation. So for those familiar with the pick and roll model, the SANS pick and roll model, the very first thing in it is preparation. Pretty much all the uh, security models in, in IR is going to be preparation. And what I call it a security 101. Uh, the basics are sadly ignored or IT and management do not understand it well enough. And maybe that includes InfoSec because we have yet, you know, been able to get these folks to actually do it. Uh, yes, it's a makeup of the organization. It's how they're structured. It's whether or not security has a, a right or a say or has any, any uh, authority to getting things done. Um, but Security 101, I am still shocked with how much information is available to people uh, that we still, I think, are getting a fail on most of it. And I would say very few companies get to the point of a D and even fewer RC, I would say less than 10% of the companies I come into contact with, and in the last five years, it's hundreds, would, I would say, oh, you're actually kind of average. Um, it's usually below that. Um, so if you do some basic things, um, that way, you know, again, they're free. These are the things I want to talk about today, things you probably already have. And this is the shocking part to me. This is stuff we already have, but yet we're not turning things on, enabling them, using them, et cetera. Um, whether that's a lack of education in, in the schools, teaching developers all the way down to, um, you know, IT people just not knowing what these things do, fear, uncertainty, a doubt, I might break something, you know, with the FUD, uh, whatever it is, uh, they just don't do it. But if you do these things, an incident is much easier and faster to deal with for sure. Um, as an incident responder blue teamer prior to going back into consulting, uh, this was something we asked the acquisitions to do. It's like, look, I, I'm not gonna be able to help it with you. A lot of times in these mergers and acquisitions, there's this concept of doing a compromise assessment. Well, before we buy them or integrate them, we have to see if they're already compromised. And, and that's kind of a sad point where you actually call the thing a compromise assessment. But if you go turn all this stuff on and do all these things that I'm gonna talk about in this presentation, you would dramatically reduce the time it takes. Um, and how we definitely caught the WinNTI hacks and, and many other since. And so that's what we're going to cover. So help us help you prepare. Show of hands. Oh, wait. Come on. <laughs> Come on, do it anyways. Even though I can't see it, I know many of you are going to raise them when I ask the questions. So how many of you have Windows Advanced Audit policies configured to at least the CIS benchmarks, or better yet, the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets with far exceeds the CIS benchmarks? Uh, how about all your Docker logging? Have you checked it? Is it on uh, Docker by default? Um, how about MySQL? Web server logging? Database server logging? Cloud logging? Office 365? The list goes on. How many of you have done it? Come on, raise your hands. I want to see all the hands. You're just going to have to tell me later that you did it. So prepare, Security 101. Enable your logs to collect all the things. Increase the size of your logs so that you can collect more than minutes. Uh, I, I run into this a lot, where people on domain controllers have default Microsoft recommended numbers, and they literally have a minute or two in their Active Directory logs. I mean, what good is that going to do? You know, it's, it's, yeah, we'll just offload them to Splunk and do it that way. No, because if Splunk breaks, I still want some data in the local logs. Disks are plenty big enough, so please um, make these things big enough. Look at them and, and try to make note of how much time you're actually collecting once you enable stuff. Uh, I think it's something that's it's often missed and it's easily set by group policy or within your, your Nix or, or Apple environment. And if you're on the endpoints, please, 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 please enable command line logging. I know there's some FUD saying, you might see some passwords, but you're right. 
you're right. But there's this cool tool called Mimikatz. And the last thing that the bad guys are going to do is spend time reading your logs when they can just run Mimikatz and steal your damn passwords or put a keystroke log on or and, and steal your passwords. So, uh, yeah, having passwords accidentally in the logs that do rotate, by the way, every, you know, two, three, five, seven, 10, 12, 15, 30 days uh, is the least of our problems. But the amount of information we get out of command line logging is incredibly vital. Uh, Brian and I have talked about this in the past. Um, you can almost say that the EDR security product was developed solely because people didn't, wouldn't, or couldn't do logging at all well. Because when you look at EDR and you look at the output it actually gives you and, and the stuff that we investigate, it literally is command line logging. So uh, in, a, in a lot of aspects, it's kind of a lot with EDR uh, works off of. Word doc opens up WScript, opens up PowerShell, blah, 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 right? I can see that same information if you enable command line logging. So it's very valuable whether you collect it to the log management or not. Um, it's hugely useful in investigating an incident response uh, environment, whether you're doing it yourself or you're using consultancy. Uh, you know, Nix and Apple have logs too. Uh, Docker, MySQL, Amazon, Azure, Office 365 as well, right? All these things have logs. And so why aren't we turning them on? I'm just still shocked at what I find, uh, even this week, last week, a month ago, two months ago. Now, of course, you know, if you have a log management solution, EDR, or other security prevention or detection solution, uh, EDR solutions can often collect local logs. So when I was at healthcare, we used a product that allowed us to literally collect the local Windows logs or Nix logs or Apple logs, pull them back, and then use a tool locally to review them uh, because the EDR solutions don't have that kind of uh, total look at the log information once it triggers an alert. It sees one thing and says, hey, I see something. Okay, what's the context you know, before and after that that tells me what kind of what happens. But EDR solutions can be useful in pulling that information. So if you are a house that uses EDR um, and it does have the capability, then turning on and increasing local logs for all platforms and all things will allow you to harvest those from your EDR solutions in many cases. So so, uh, very useful to us IR folks. Uh, log management, obviously with a good agent, collecting all the right things provides a ton of data for incident response. So yes, log management would be awesome if everybody had it and Splunk would love you to pay licensing. And I know a lot of people don't have it, but there's lots of options for log collection, uh, which is an entirely different conversation and, and presentation. But logs can make it easier and faster for to deal with an incident, right? Or for an IR firm to find it faster, thus saves you money in the long run. Let's give you an example. When I first joined the gaming firm um, back in what, 2012, about a month and a half after I joined, we got, we got nailed by WinNTI. Uh, Mandiant came in, spent about two weeks. I think our total bill was in excess of 200K. Uh, the next time we got popped in 2014, by that time we had been there long enough and got all the tools that, were, that we had purchased uh, pretty much as I joined or just before I joined. And we got those configured and doing what we wanted to. Uh, boom, 2014 when NTI attack, they tend to do an every other year attack. Once they figure out what you caught and how you did it, they go morph their, their MO and then they come back and nail you later once they get in and find a reason to get in, like a, a game publish or, or a, a game termination and, and they take advantage of a bunch of resumes or whatnot. And they finally get back in. In 2014, when again we got nailed, we used all of our tools, we did all the things. Manient, you know, again, we had a retainer with them, so they came out. We got rid of them in three and a half days. And so we actually just justified our salaries by that kind of effort and preparation. Because of all the stuff turned on and all the stuff we collected, we basically had Mandiant come in and said, here's everything we found. They looked and said, yeah, we're not seeing anything more. Thank you, bye. And we just saved tons of money. So it definitely is a money saver, and there's a real world case. Prepare. Do you or can you monitor for, show hands, everybody show hands, uh, new account creations, new container instance or bucket creations in the case of clouds, uh, you know, EC2 kind of stuff and uh, S3 buckets. Uh, admin accounts, logging into multiple systems, right? This is a typical case where an admin, uh, red team especially, will hit one, two, three, five, ten 10 systems uh, when they're poning you or the WinNTI group, uh, APT guys will get in and, and hit a bunch of systems or any kind of SMB spread that's using admin creds. Um, again, this is a great indicator because this is just not normal behavior. And if it is, then you probably can baseline that. You know, Bob, Alice, and Mary are my 
my desktop admins and they're constantly doing this, okay, that means their, their baselining is they're doing it between eight and five. Uh, they're always launching it from this PC or these three PCs and you can kind of baseline that. But the minute it goes outside that norm, uh, then bam, you, you can have something to alert you on. Uh, new service creations. This oddly is the one thing in Windows that's on by default. Uh, Metasploit, for example, will start and, and install a service. So you should be able to detect that, a 7045 event. Uh, PS Exec, another commonly used tool, will start a new service. So that also uh, is something that can be detected. Uh, new task or cron creations. Again, uh, malware uses this pretty heavily. Bad guys use this pretty heavily in the Windows and Nix arena. Uh, email, VPN, Citrix, cloud logins. Are you looking at that? Uh, do you know if people are beating on your internet facing environments and, and uh, trying to log into them? Uh, knowing this information can justify that you block these foreign IPs and foreign countries from trying to log in because you know your people uh, don't come from those locations or to build whitelists to allow them to come from those uh, marked countries, for example. Suspic suspicious processes and C users. Uh, most malware in the Windows space will start under user space, meaning uh, there are variables, percent temp being one of them, percent app data being another one of them, that the malware will be written to utilize because they know they have rights to, to create files there and drop their payloads there. And so a lot of malware, 90, 95% of typical commodity malware that hits a user in the Windows space will start and see users. So you can baseline that and look for suspicious activity, for example. And you can't monitor very well for this without better logging if you don't turn it on and enable it. You cannot monitor for anything real useful if you don't enable the logging to collect the right things. I know John Strand talks about this. Don't collect all the things, collect the right things. Well, you gotta collect all the things to determine what the right things are. So he, he's a little right. Um, and he does sometimes say that you gotta collect all the things on a few systems, figure out what the right things are and then roll that out. It'd be the, probably the, the best way to state it. Then you can collect the right stuff, the things that you want to monitor for, the targeted high value type alerts like new service installs, like executions and C users, like a cron job being added, a scheduled task being added, et cetera. Um, and of course, if you have a log management solution, uh, you can alert on things real easily, right? But still, the logging must be enabled, or I can't even use Arthur or free tool and LogMD to hunt for artifacts of an incident on Windows, right? But you have to at least turn it on. And have you considered a free or paid cloud logging solution that you can push agents to all of your systems and enable it uh, if, if something happens? So for example, um, you build a config in Splunk, you go into Splunk Cloud, you sign up for a free 30-day Splunk Cloud scenario, or you pay for the absolute minimum, you send a handful of systems to it, and then if something occurs, you flip the bit to spend more money, you send all your data by telling the agent to start and boom, all the stuff immediately shows up in a cloud solution as an example. Um, and you pay for it as you need it. So that means you can pre-deploy your logging agents, WinLogB, FileLogBeat, Splunk Universal Forwarder, whatever it is that, that you're using. Um, in this case, Humio would use FileBeats and WinLogBeats. And you can pre-configure this stuff, just sit it in Active Directory and say, disable the service. And then bam, when I push a button in Active Directory to say, go tell everybody to turn on their, their logging, it'll send everything to the cloud that you've already pre-configured and, and set up. Uh, Humio is an example I personally use to monitor my stuff. You can get about five systems in there. It holds about two gig a day, seven day retention, and it's free. So if you wanna play with this and start doing stuff, there's a Humio cheat sheet on uh, malware archeology. span uh, This is a great way to play with this mentality. And not, you're not gonna pay a thing. But if you needed to, you can take that config, put it in your labs, put it in your own, your own security desktops and whatnot, and then get that ready, push it out to all the machines, have all the services sitting there, and then just with a simple flip of, of group policy, boom, send it to Humio and then just pay the bill as you need it um, and pick your log management solution of choice. But here's a way to play. Um, but that's something to think about. Um, and again, I doubt too many people do this. So let's talk about DevOps story. And you thought I was just a Windows guy, sheesh. Okay, I think I hear people laughing. Hey, I, I investigated a, a recent ransom incident. No, not ransomware, just ransom. Uh, the user was on a Mac, uh, they were running Docker and within the Docker uh, container running MySQL, okay? And that was the makeup of this particular scenario. 
yay, Mac OS, right? Apple enables logs by default. That was very useful in this engagement. Highly, highly useful in this engagement. Uh, again, running Docker containers. Um, MySQL was in one of the containers. Docker by default, MySQL by default, no logging. So yeah, it left me, it left me crying because how the heck are we gonna know what happened if we don't have logs to see what the activity was that caused this incident to begin with. So what can we see? How do we know what happened? Apple logs showed Docker running, but there was no network traffic. It just says, yeah, I got Docker running over here. I can see it, um, but that's it. It was bridged, so all the network traffic was happening, happening within the Docker container. Um, and within Docker, we could see that port 3306 was open to any any. So now we know that it was exposed and therefore uh, when the Mac woke up uh, or was awake, that 3306 was open and without a personal firewall or firewall product, cable router, whatnot, that uh, protected you, this is a, a pretty bad uh, vulnerability. This could happen in somebody's AWS environment with setting security policy or even a corporate firewall that set a, set a policy that enabled this port. Uh, which meant MySQL was open. So I used Heidi SQL to connect to the database, tried the default creds and got in. And I started crying again. Uh, but it was on a Mac. Uh, the clamshell lid was closed, right? So clamshell lids close on laptops. That means, uh, that means nothing can happen, right? The power is off, clamshell is in sleep mode, hibernate mode. Uh, so how'd they get in? At least that was the belief that if the clamshell, clamshell lid was closed, then uh, the system was powered down. So how'd they get in? Well, the Apple logs to the rescue, fortunately. Uh, clamshell, which is what Apple refers to it in the logs, uh, opening and closing are in the logs. And it tells you when you close the clamshell that it's prepping it for hibernate mode. But it also shows that Apple will wake up the network for many things, patching, updates, et cetera. So closing the lid does not mean the network was off. So even though in this case, the Apple lid was closed on this laptop, the network was still up and running, thus Docker was still up and running, thus MySQL was still up and running on port 3306, and it was on a unblocked, unfettered internet connection. And that's how they got in. So port 3306, any, any, in Docker, default cred, so bother. Closing the lid did not power it off. Didn't power down the Docker MySQL con uh, containers or anything else. Clearly default conditions caused this, lack of good logging made it hard. So yes, more than logs. So do you have a process or procedure or both to configure containers used by developers? Uh, in this case, they took a look at the container makeup and found that uh, over uh, a dozen or so containers were similarly configured. So they had to go make changes, um, yeah. Right, they didn't have this stuff turned on. So immediately upon this incident, it caused a change to say, we gotta go turn this stuff on. So verify the logs are enabled, verify default creds are not used, verify ports are not open. Um, do you guys do this as part of your DevOps work? And, and do you make sure that before you roll this stuff out to laptops that go out in the world, you know, into these unfettered, unprotected internet connections, uh, are, are you good? Um, and again, doing this will help the reduction of incidents. Doing this will dramatically help IR people like me or an IR firm also like me. Did I say I work for NCC Group? So yes, it significantly helps. Uh, what should have taken us a couple days probably took us about five days to figure this out. So there's an example of real world savings. So let's talk about Windows. Local account passwords. This is a big problem because uh, once the red team gets in, they're gonna basically snarf off your local administrator account um, and they're gonna be able to crawl left and right and go everywhere they want to because everybody tends to use the same administrator credentials, which is uh, a really poor practice. Um, SMB attacks will also capitalize on same kind of logic, right? It's the same everywhere. I can just crawl across the environment. And so does anyone losing laps, local administrator password solution? Kind of funky to set up, but it is free. It comes from Microsoft. And it is a way to make every endpoint's local accounts unique within Windows. Uh, again, free, right? So, and the admin account is stored 
The password is stored within Active Directory. You can use PowerShell to retrieve it so the help desk guys can still do their job if they need to, uh, but really they should be using uh, domain accounts for this sort of stuff, not the local admin accounts unless absolutely necessary. And there is a way through the LAPS configuration to do that. So again, it makes it harder for lateral movement. I pop a box, I get the local admin cred, I then try using it everywhere else, bam, suddenly I get a bunch of high failure rates, 4625s, and potentially alerting you, uh, well, possibly, if you're collecting and looking for these things, but it, again, reduction is what we're after, right? So there is a possibility you can catch them by these failed login attempts. Group policy security. There are all kinds of things you can do. Uh, DerbyCon 2019, the last DerbyCon, sadly, uh, Sean Metcalf did a great talk on AD security, um, on talking about the things you can do to take away recon from red teamers and literally hide attributes that cannot be queried that normally are queried. Um, so take a look look at his presentation. I talked to him about coming out with a cheat sheet and he was, in, that's when he informed me, he says we're writing a white paper on how to do this. So he'll be publishing that on his website. I um, mean, the goal here is to slow them down, whether it's the WinNTI type ABT folks, the red teamers, um, you wanna slow them down. You want them to make more noise or break their recon or other things they can exploit. That's really the goal here, right? Reduce the attack surface, reduce the ability to uh, cause an incident and hopefully improve your ability to detect them. Other tech, two-factor anyone? Uh, this is interesting because uh, I've been saying this for years. This is something we found in, in dealing with some of the acquisitions in my previous gig. Uh, if you have email, Citrix, VPN, RDP, cloud, et cetera, facing the internet, you are vulnerable. Uh, MFA will cripple these attacks from cred stealing campaigns and passwords harvested from other breaches. Uh, they will make noise because of the failures and they will alert you. Uh, this will help so many things that hit organizations today, like ransomware attacks, um, cred stealing attacks, right? A lot of these campaigns we get now are nothing more than emails that take you to a website that's made to look like your 0365 login because they've verified you're using 0365 for mail and they'll replicate your page. You It pops up in an email, you enter your credentials, they steal your credentials, they go to your external 0365, they log in, they can do email campaigns or they go to a VPN, they download your profile, create the profile and they log into your VPN and, and all kinds of things like that or worse, you have RDP facing the internet. And so this is a, a high highly successful attack. It's how a lot of uh, RDP uh, ransomware attacks occur, right? They get a cred from somewhere, whether you cough it up in a cred stealing email or whether it's a, another uh, uh, organization that got compromised and you're doing password recycling. And they just sit there and beat on your devices and, and see how many they can log into. They record it, sometimes sell those to other groups, will then use them to compromise you once it's been validated. The cool thing is Microsoft recently announced uh, and published a, a study they did where 99% of companies compromised uh, in regards to username passwords were due to lack of MFA. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with him here because I know in the cases I've investigated where credentials were lost and they attacked the front end infrastructure, whether it was Citrix, VPNs, email, uh, Sing, sign on self-service, whatever it is, uh, that MFA would have crippled these attacks. So uh, I'm gonna agree with Microsoft here that this is a big win if you were to enable MFA. Now this is something theoretically you do have to purchase, um, but turning off these services until you do MFA or causing some other way of, of authenticating uh, would definitely help you reduce your attack surface for sure. So how about email? How many are blocking the known bad file extensions? Uh, there's been so many attacks in this space that last year in September, Microsoft added 38 more uh, file extensions that they recommended blocking the URLs here. Um, and these, this list has been around for a long time. They were designed initially to put in to uh, Exchange Server. Many of them are in Outlook. A lot of people do not enable this feature, which is built in free for Exchange users, Office 365, your iron port gateways, etc. cetera. Um, if you take these lists and you block these attachment types, um, then definitely you can reduce your attack surface and thus your likelihood of an incident. I know in our case in uh, 
the healthcare company that I went initially went to work for, uh, this was one of the first things we took on. We we had Iron Port. We got a whole bunch of of malware campaigns. We analyzed what we were getting by copying ourselves on all the campaigns. If it's got these extensions, these extensions, these extensions, copy us. We did metrics on it. We showed that we were having hundreds to thousands of attacks per month with these file extensions. There's no use in the organization to actually let the user have them. If we block these, we're going to dramatically reduce our attacks. And so we implemented those, and sure enough, hundreds and hundreds of attacks uh, a month went down. Uh, and then recently, the IQY files, this weird uh, Excel, you know, obscure file type uh, started coming out and was being utilized for ransomware attacks. So you do have to keep up on the latest and greatest uh, uses and compromises of these um, and make sure that your email gateways do not allow these into the organization. If you have a need for these file types that are in these lists, then I would recommend you teach your people how to properly archive them with passwords and send them in in the appropriate manner with a email and password through a second uh, media and, and get that working that way. Uh, better yet, have you considered changing the way extensions act when a user double clicks them? We, we did a test on this and said, all right, what impact of the users will this have? And so we changed group policy to say, when you open WSF, WSH, uh, JSE, JSF, uh, VBS, when the user double clicks, what happens? Well, they launch the scripting engine. Well, if you get an email that has this file attachment and the user double clicks it, it launched the scripting engine and infects them. So by changing group policy to say open notepad, when the user double clicks it, now the macro and the scripting just opens up a notepad and they, they're looking at a, a screen of garbage and they open up a help desk going, what's this? And I much rather have them do that than get infected. And so this is a, an option for people to do. Again, free in group policy, right? Anything that opens in a scripting engine can be broken when the user double clicks if you do this change. And it doesn't, change the way, you know, IT would do it in a login script or anything like that, or a proper script. It only deals with uh, email attachments and the users double clicking and, and Microsoft's uh, association with that at file extension. So uh, something to consider, again, free. Deny the double click, I call it. How about network prep? So, of course, one of the things we constantly are asked is, uh, you know, did we lose any data? Um, and so I asked this of everybody with network gear. So can you see the producer consumer ratio PCR uh, in your network gear? Uh, it's a range of minus one to plus one. Uh, we have this in logmd for our shrum data that we collect. Um, but a lot of network gear will do this. The Percatas have it built in, for example. Uh, Bro will have this uh, built in. Where what you're looking for is items that tend to lean more towards the plus one. It's a mathematical formula. And this indicates exfil. So the closer to plus one it is, that means the more data going outbound than coming in, as opposed to minus one, which is more data com, uh, coming in than going out, right? Typical web surfing will be closer to, to minus one. A typical OneDrive or Dropbox will be a plus one. And so are you looking at these kinds of things? Um, in the course of us doing compromise assessments in healthcare, we would have Bricotta and we would look for this condition to see what kind of large external sending of data exists so we can map that and we could find that that healthcare companies are using Dropbox and OneDrive and Google Drive and, and all kinds of things they probably shouldn't be using in order to make policies and cut that down. Um, and so this is something that, that people should look at just to be able to have an idea of what kind of data is leaving. Uh, we use this to investigate a consultant that had come on site uh, several years ago and they triggered our IPS, our SecureWorks IPS and said, hey, this guy's got Kofter. And it turned out to be a consultant. So we, uh, again, asked him, hey, can we look at your system? And we did our little IR thing on it, ran LogMD, uh, harvested the SHRUM data. And the SHRUM data is a 60-day database that dumps information every hour about network traffic. And by extracting that, we were able to see that he had been affected over 60 days because every hour for every day in the SHRUM database was uh, Kofter sending out data and that he had lost 60 gigabytes of data, which caused legal to then say, oh, is there any of our data on this laptop? And they investigated it, found there wasn't, and so we were not at risk. So there's a lot of benefits to looking at this kind of data and making sure that you turn it on and that you have the ability to collect it in the event of an incident. Um, also, DNS text records. Again, it's, it's a matter of the DNS flow. Uh, AV vendors will use DNS text records for communication back and forth, but also the bad guys will send commands. When NTI used it, uh, several other campaigns use it. So the length of tech record is, is often an indicator of bad. So are you collecting it? Can you even see it? So network prep also comes into play here. 
Uh, email web prep, more, more signs of hands. Come on, raise them, raise them. How many block unregistered domains? Uh, this, is, this is an interesting one. Uh, these domains have not been categorized, right? So if you go and you go to google.com and you take that URL and you go to one of the uh, URL investigation sites, you plug it in there, uh, URLs are categorized generally, right? Google will be a search engine, uh, WordPress will be a blog site, et cetera. Um, and one of the things we did in the course of getting OpenDNS um, and implementing that was we started looking at the attacks, taking the URLs and running them through several websites to categorize the attack as to what kind of attack it was. Did it, was it an email attachment? Was it a URL attack? Because once we block the file types, they send us a lot of Word docs and Excel spreadsheets. Once we implemented uh, Ironport AMP, which looked at Word docs, Excel spreadsheets, and PDFs, you know, those fell off like a, like a, cliff as well. And we stopped getting those because they weren't allowed in the organization. So they moved to sending us URLs that then went out to these sites and downloaded, uh, convinced the user to download a zip file or Word doc and, and execute that way. And so we started looking at what the makeup of these URLs were. And we found that about 95% of the attacks that we investigated were uncategorized URLs. Uh, I think Deb Kennedy once said, um, I just don't allow anything that's not in the top million of Alexa. Uh, similar kind of concept here is use something like that logic and say, uh, can we, do we have a web proxy or the ability of blocking um, URLs that are not categorized, properly categorized? And you'll be shocked on C2 servers and malware campaigns how many of these are truly uncategorized. So if you were to block those and not allow those in, even though you received the email and the user tried to click on the URL, the web proxy would say, nah, I don't think so. And it would, it would block the event. Again, reducing your attack surface. Or can you get to the point you're prepared to block them in the case of an incident? That's probably another important point is be prepared to do this. Much like I mentioned in the uh, preparing your log agent potentially and, and going through that tabletop exercise, if you want to call it, to say, I'm prepared to send this and pay the money for log management. I don't have it in the budget, but we could if we had to, and here's how. Uh, same scenario here. We could, you, everybody can do this. I'm sure they already have the technology, um, but can you go ahead and, and turn on and block these uncategorized sites in the event of an incident? Or as you investigate something, yeah, you can get to Josh's blog or Michael's blog, so what? Um, that, that's, that doesn't interrupt business too much. It just interrupts people surfing, right? And so better yet, just block and allow exceptions and, and have help desk tickets open it up after you investigate it. Saying, yes, you can go to Mike's site and Josh's site and, and AJ's site. Enable the Windows Firewall. Uh, this is, again, something I'm surprised organizations don't do. They're afraid of blocking things, but built into Windows by default is an any, any option for the Windows Firewall. So you can, without using a Windows Firewall for any kind of enforcement, turn on the logging. And the important thing this provides us incident responders and investigators is it tells me the process name going to the IP address. So uh, an IPS IDS, for example, will tell me, you know, 1.2.2.2 is being talked to outbound. Great, which process is doing it? I don't know. It's just, it's, it's that IP address. Go, t go figure out who owns that IP address and then you go that and figure it out. Well, the Windows firewall will tell you that it's Skype or tell you that it's malware XYZ. Um, and so there's a lot of value here to collect this information in local logs. You will have to increase the size of local logs but it's incredibly valuable to investigate uh, when you do have an incident. Um, very noisy if you want to collect the log management. So there's some thought to be given there. Uh, also by turning it on, if you do enablement and you actually do policy blocking, you can kill lateral movement because now the, the SMBs and all that net use traffic that is PC to PC is not allowed. And if you do need it for desktop admins and the like, then you can set up rules to allow these certain subnets to, to do that. That's completely an, an option within group policy to set that up. Um, but breaking lateral movement's a big one because uh, once they get in with one cred, boom, they have a run of the environment. Once they get in with SMB1, boom, they have the run environment. Turn on the Windows firewall, boom, they get nowhere and they make lots of noise theoretically, thus catching the pen tester and or the APT actor or the commodity malware or ransomware trying to spread throughout your environment. 
If you are using WinRM, it can also be used to secure WinRM. Uh, WinRM is a remoting tool. A lot of organizations use it. Uh, Arthur depends on it to do PowerShell remoting in the environments. And you would use the Windows firewall to secure that. So you would have the ability of, of using Windows RM to hunt or, or do incident response, but make sure it only occurs from these two, three, five workstations or this particular subnet. So the bad guys would have to pop those boxes in order to use it. And it also generates log info, which can be detectable. And of course, better logging is definitely a preparation we should all do. Hunting. Some say hunting is the creation of a hypothesis and then you go searching for it. I say do that after you search for obvious well-known artifacts or IOCs. 90% uh, of attacks have several things in common. Uh, they, you know, in Windows, they generally always execute and start in user space. They generally always pick on a handful of auto runs. They typically uh, start new tasks, right? There's some very predictable things that uh, malware tends to do from a commodity perspective. There are very predictable things that red teams do, PSExec, uh, you know, Metasploit, et cetera, where they create services. There are things you can look for that are very predictable, very uh, consistent among these types of attacks that you can eliminate that you don't have. Um, and then once you do that, you've, you've helped yourself create a process to uh, do hunting and so you can start simple in that aspect. If you do good preparation, then IR becomes much easier and faster to do. By you or us, your preferred IR consultancy, uh, of course, uh, I work for NCC Group, so I'm going to do my shameless plug there. Um, but also, it, it enables your ability to hunt. You'll have a lot more data you can use to hunt with by turning this stuff on, right? If you, you can check to see if the Windows firewall is enabled. You can, you can hunt to see if you can do a net use. You can hunt to see if you can do an SMB share. You can hunt to see if you can reuse an admin credential that, you, that you've harvested off a machine, right? Um, and again, WinRM is built into every Windows system. It's, it's the answer of, I don't want to install another agent. Well, WinRM is already on the box is built into Windows, so you can answer the question of another agent. And Arthur is just a tool to utilize that to push things out, right? It's free. Um, you can look and verify that you don't have certain things proactively, which we call hunting. Um, it, it's not just a hypothesis, what am I going to go look at? Um, but you can actually say, I don't have these things. I don't have any uh, interesting things in the WMI database. I don't have any obfuscation in my PowerShell logs. I don't have any weird things running in C users. I don't have any weird auto runs in these 10 locations, whatnot. There are definitely things you can eliminate. I say for, hunt for things you know you don't have and eliminate them. This helps you create a process for hunting. It helps you create a process for investigation of incident response as well. It, it also is what we'll use when we come on site as our incident responders. Um, it's, it's typical practice, right? So check to see if your logging is enabled. Are certain ports open or closed, like I had mentioned with the Docker MySQL scenario? Um, and again, doesn't take very long to do some of these checks. Are the default creds used? Well, you know, my uh, Heidi, Heidi SQL, Logging into 3306 to these containers you're about to publish, a uh, simple check would tell you right there using the root, root password for MySQL. Um, auto runs, pick, a, hand, you know, pick a, a handful of auto runs or pick a tool that will do auto runs and check to see if you have any bad indicators uh, of what's going on there. Usually what you see in the parameter, the command line portion of the uh, auto run is where the bad will occur. Uh, large keys containing payloads to script. Can do you have something that can check the registry to say, I don't have any large keys of over 20K, I have a handful of them, but they're pretty normal. Um, they don't look like a binary, don't look like a PowerShell script, don't look like a W script, don't look like, like MSHTA execution, like you see with Covter. And so you can eliminate that you have that. Has anybody done a sticky key exploit uh, using the null byte entries and, and hiding stuff in the registry, uh, for example? Uh, suspicious WMI entry, database entries. Are there any of those? PowerShell executions, obfuscation, large block sizes, etc. cetera. Um, suspicious executions of C users. Uh, organizations, we did a study of, of three organizations uh, a while back, um, a gaming, a cloud company, and a uh, healthcare company. And we said, all right, what's the percentage of commonality amongst all the um, endpoints in the systems? Uh, servers, were a little unique in that most servers, again, running server 2012, 2016, whatever, 2003, 2008, um, if they had a similar function, they weren't far off. But obviously if one's doing you know, SQL and one's doing web apps, there, there's a big difference there. But on a desktop, the shocking thing that we found was around 75 to 80% 
the, the graph was pretty flat. It had a, a minor increase of about five to 10% variance. That means out of uh, 700 assets, uh, 250 assets, and, and about 7,000 assets, about 75 or 80% of those assets had the same software. There were very few uniquenesses. Those would be the applications of say HR or accounting or things like that that are unique to those uh, departments. And then the last 15% or so is where it took off where you had these administrators developers installed just about anything and everything. And what that tells you from an IR perspective, I can help really well to com to clean up and remediate that 75%, 70, 75% where the graph is really low, but where it starts to take off and spike, that's where you have to re-image. The, the ability to investigate those be it becomes a whole lot of effort. All right, so understanding what executes in your environment and what the commonality is will help you. And suspicious executions and C users is one of them. Everybody's got Firefox, everybody's got Notepad++, Chrome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's pretty deterministic, especially if your users aren't administrators and you've deployed this stuff and you're using configuration management, your commonality amongst endpoints and even servers should be very consistent. So it'd be easier to look for those suspicious uh, executions, which also feeds into the lull bin living off the land executions. You should know what the norm is for the RegServe 32s run to LL 32s because when the bad guys use them or the red team uses them, the parameters, the command line parameters they execute are incredibly obvious to folks that do incident response and alerting. Um, also look at injected processes a little hard. You do need a tool to do that. Uh, many of us rely on EDR, maybe even AV. There are tools that you can use to scan your, your running processes to look for signs of injection, figure out what's normal. Um, you can use that to hunt. You can use that for incident response, but uh, definitely something to look for. There is a movement towards red teamers and bad guys using this uh, low bend mentality to go out to the internet, download code, compile the code, run it in memory, and then uh, write the auto run to kind of repeat that. Not a typical commodity type attack. Um, not a typical thing that we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, definitely movement towards a, a more stealthy mechanism because you can search the disk all day long for files. There's nothing there. And then when you shut down the box, they write to the disk, they write their auto run, system boots up, they load their, their uh, auto run, the auto run loads the payload, throws it in memory, deletes it off disk. We saw that with WinNTI um, and several commodity malware attacks um, that do that as well. And there's many more things you can hunt for. If you hunt for things that are found in 90% of today's attacks on your systems, you can eliminate or reduce the probability that you do not have obvious indicators. Again, a great way to start the process of how to investigate and how to do hunting. Right, because you've turned this stuff on, there's more things available for you to actually use. And there's more things for people like me and IR firms to use to be able to find the bad quicker, which means we're not there as long, which means it costs you less. It's a great thing, good way to justify your salary. Um, this helps uh, in an incident, right? You can use the same tools and logic and apply it to an incident where, you know, hunting tools are nothing more than the same thing we do with incident response. A lot of the tools we use do a memory dump or, or go hunt or triage toolkits, logmd, whether it's an incident, whether it's for hunting, same tool, right? Because you're prepared to enable things, which also helps us help you. Sort of looks like me, that's why I used it, right? MITRE ATTACK, gotta talk about MITRE ATTACK. You can map your preparation to MITRE ATTACK. Uh, what I do recommend to people in my uh, attack class is to go print some 36 by 48, laminate them, three or four or five or 10 copies of the MITRE ATTACK technique uh, IDs, and you post that on, on the walls around your org, and you basically start taking some uh, colored pens and you go highlight the areas you think you have coverage, and then you can use colors to indicate maturity. Uh, yellow, I think I have a little coverage here. Green, oh, we got this covered. Uh, red, definitely don't have anything. Gray, I don't know. And where I do have something, maybe go light blue, dark blue, and, and uh, green for, for maturity, right? Um, but you can definitely map your, your preparation to technique IDs. The reason I like MITRE ATT&CK is uh, for years, uh, one of our, our, our famous uh, uh, leaders here in the community, Phil Byer, used to ask me, but how do you know what to go look for? Right. Well, MITRE ATT&CK hadn't published what they did, but generally, if I could have answered back then when he had asked me this question, I would say, well, MITRE ATT&CK. Because one of the things I, I found in working for HP um, and in my career afterwards and then working in healthcare and especially in gaming, where I applied all the thought, things I thought I knew and had to deal with the Chinese was a lot of what's in MITRE ATT&CK, because again, they map to the actual adversaries, um, are covered. Um, and it's what 
when NTI did. They installed new services, right? They wrote payloads to the registry. They loaded things, um, changed the permissions. They did a lot of things that can be mapped to MITRE ATT&CK. So you can look and say, you know, what do I have coverage wise just simply by doing a bunch of color coding on a MITRE ATT&CK uh, matrix, as I'll call it, that you laminate and can erase and, and do. And you can use this to then uh, decide how to do incident response. You can decide how to, how to map your hunts. Well, I'm going to go hunt for things I'm weak so I can justify budget and justify our weaknesses and theoretically uh, trigger a, a defense or a prevention solution, right? You can test your s situation with uh, firing off these these or attack scenarios. There are also tools that will emulate the uh, adversary and you can use those tools as well. So uh, Meta from Uber and, and others, um, Atomic, Red, Atomic uh, Red Team and uh, Attack Canary and all those. Um, and again, it helps you know you don't have these things going on in your environment, right? So if you say, look, I've looked for these things, I know I don't have them, then your brain can start working and, and get more detailed or you can hire a firm to come do a more detailed say, here's what I have done, but I haven't covered all these other areas that I haven't marked here. So I need you to help me to do an extensive hunt for this and help us improve our hunting and or IR capabilities, right? Preparation helps you do this and will help you during an incident for sure. Attack gives you things to map your defenses to or what you can and have. Everyone has gaps. You do not need to uh, detect on everything in MITRE ATT&CK. You just have to make sure that if ATT&CK consists of four things, you're probably doing at least half of them. That theoretically will alert somebody, and then as you investigate, you'll find number three and four to be able to paint the whole picture because you've enabled all the things I've talked about already. Um, knowing the gaps allows you to be prepared and identify items for budget. This is a big bonus for people that utilize MITRE ATT&CK is identifying your gaps so you can ask for budget and then justify that budget. Um, or know that you don't have coverage in these areas so that you're going to have to be more clever and come up with ways to hunt and or detect. Um, however, you might come up with those. Probably another topic for another talk. Um, and again, uh, prepare means know what you can and cannot do, have or do not have. It's important for you to understand that an in incident response. Yeah, I don't have flow logs, so I can't tell you flow in and out of my AWS environment or whatever, right? Because I didn't turn that on. Um, no, I don't have that. I'm not enabling my firewall logging because it just overwhelms the firewalls and it rolls, the database doesn't hold enough and it rolls every hour. So we don't turn that on. It's just, an, it's, it's, it's worthless and it's, an un, you know, it's a burden to my old firewalls, right? So knowing what you, what you have and don't have is important and what you can and can't do. And MITRE ATT&CK can definitely help you with that. So in conclusion, IR is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Preparation is key. Security 101, enable what you have. Pretty much everything I talked about in this presentation is stuff that's built into our organizations, things you can do. Uh, MFA would be exclusions, but you know there are a lot of MFA that's available for free or cheap um, or built-in solutions which haven't turned on uh, Amazon for one of them, right? They give it to you. Um, Security 101, enable what you have. Enable logs everywhere. Uh, this Prezo definitely spelled out some areas I see weaknesses in uh, every time I go to a client or do an acquisition investigation. So uh, please turn this stuff on, even if it's collecting locally for investigation purposes and for your own investigations and or validation that stuff is configured as you expect. Block well-known exploded file types. This is huge win here. I would say by doing this alone through our iron port, in the case of healthcare, we dropped 60 to 70% of our attacks. Now they ramped up and went to the Word doc types, which I can't block obviously, but again, justifies budget that you need to buy a solution uh, to deal with those, those Word docs and, and Excel spreadsheets and PDFs, right? So it definitely helps. Disables the user's double click of bad file types is another uh, option, right? You can block macros. Not every user needs macros. Not every user needs to enable content. Uh, Office 2016 has that as an Active Directory. You can block block that by default. So this concept of enable macros and enable content goes away and then just make exceptions, deal with it by exceptions. But it is free. It's just people labor here. And yes, people labor is not free. I understand that. Uh, block unknown domains or prepare to, the uncategorized stuff. Um, 
when you do investigations, take a look, throw some of these domains you're investigating into these uh, websites and uh, Fortinet is one I'd recommend and, and definitely look to see what the categorization is. And I think you're gonna be surprised at how many of these commodity attacks are using uncategorized websites, right? So MAPA, WordPress, Joomla, Drupal sites that are definitely not in the Alexa top million. Uh, prep your network to see the things. Um, for example, I tell people to turn on the debug logs in Cisco uh, firewalls and everybody's like, what, you can't do that, blah, 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 debug. I don't know, Cisco allows you to turn on and off the ASA log numbers. So uh, what you do is you figure out what log events you actually want to collect and you turn off the ones you don't want to collect. The debug logs for Windows, for uh, Cisco firewalls, for example, the ASA stuff will uh, collect the VPN login information if you're using Cisco VPN and it's highly valuable for obviously detection and who's beaten on your VPN. Um, it's so you can see China knocking and whatnot. So this thing became very valuable for us to put in country blocks to see that information. You will have to turn on debug logs to do so. Um, so there's lots of things you can do in your network. Make sure you can see PCR. You may even want to get to the point of being able to see NetFlow. It all depends on what your gear can do, but definitely uh, look into it and turn some of these things on. Um, enable something to allow you to hunt. Big fix, SSCM, you have to tweak inventories, do inventories, uh, WinRM, Arthur, free, uh, whatever you have, big fix is a huge, great tool for that. Um, any of those kinds of configuration management tools, see if you can exploit those because many organizations have those to see if you can ask a question of the system like OS query and whatnot, to see if uh, Google GER, et cetera, uh, to see if you can get an answer back from the system with tools you already have or potentially some of the others I just meant. And then map what you have to MITRE ATT&CK. I think you'll see long term goals in discussing with management because now you have a common language between uh, doing a red team engagement, doing a purple team engagement, blue team engagement, uh, talking to, to management, uh, planning your, your defenses, hunting, etc. You can all base that on MITRE ATT&CK to make it easy to share the same language. And resources, here's where you find us. Um, I think most of the community um, know me and know where to find us stuff, but uh, this is where you can get all the info. I will uh, publish this uh, presentation. Uh, here's a link to AD Security's uh, presentation on uh, Iron Geek's website for Sean Metcalf stuff, and then that's where you find us. And that's it. You can open it Thank up for you, any Michael. question. Awesome stuff, Michael. Thank you. Great talk. We are past time, but we can still stick around because, you know, no one has a commute back to the office. If you have any questions for Michael, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Or, or if not, you always have Michael's uh, Twitter handle and the website there that has email address so you can ask him outside of the, the presentation here. Come on. I asked you to raise hands. Please tell us who raised their hands when I ask the questions. <laughs> Anybody? Anyway. Yeah, see, this is the this is the challenge of webinars, right? Um, as you see, people raise hands and cons causes people to ask more questions once they hear the question. In webinars, we have this lull of interaction. This is one of the challenges of doing a webinar. Um, you know, show a hands, right? Get people to nod, see how they're reacting, give examples, see people roll their eyes. Oh yeah, I've seen that one. Um, so if you haven't done a webinar, I recommend you do one. Uh, practice uh, talking to yourself because that's really what it's like. Uh, and then figure out how to interact at the end by this question scenario. Some people do the polls, they you know, run the polls and say, here's a poll, please answer as a way to interact with people. Come on, speak up. Come on, folks. Not one question? Not a single question here. Not even what's my favorite beer? We heard that IPA earlier, didn't we? Oh, I did that at the last con, what, last year, and we did that, uh, <laughs> what's that called, reverse, Pick a category. You're you're you have to debate this this side whether you like it or not. And I got yeah. the against IPA side, which was a bummer. <laughs> yeah, speed debate. Speed debates. Yeah, and I got why is IPA the worst beer ever? Because it's built into the the acronym IPA. IP a lot. Who the hell wants to drink beer where you IP a lot? Yeah. If nobody has any questions, we can always wrap it up or we can continue talking here. But at the same point, I do know, I, I know my person, I need to get back to other things too. Unfortunately, Michael, this has been work, great. Work, Thank work. you for doing the, yeah, I know that whole work thing that never ends. Unfortunately, even with the work at home stuff. Uh, once again, there was a question in the chat, Kyle. Oh, did I miss one? Sorry. Yeah, just now. 
the how many people are working from home and how would you protect these? Ah, working from home. <laughs> it's very th very strongly and topical. Yeah, it is. Uh, this is where a lot of the configuration comes into play, right? If you properly configure the laptops that we have, uh, much like the Docker instance scenario, then if something does trigger, uh, obviously there'd be data to collect and investigate. Um, there are tools like, let's say you were running Splunk, uh, for example, I'm not just picking on Splunk, just everybody knows what Splunk is, um, or your EDR uh, cloud-based, uh, you can open up the ports required for communication uh, of, your, of your Splunk universal forwarder, for example, or your file beat, uh, Win log beat if you're phoning home to the enterprise and you can build an internet facing gateway to allow this data to come back. Um, so I'm guessing a lot of people did not design this big fix, for example, has an internet gateway where you could do this, um, where you could actually put these gateways in place in the event of something like this going forward. This is definitely a strategy where suddenly things that were inside the enterprise can now be uh, allowed to be communicated communicated to outside the enterprise. Um, and COVID shows that maybe cloud isn't all that bad, right? Because it doesn't matter where you are, um, your information can go to the cloud for like EDR, log management and the like. Um, so I would say one, the configuration definitely applies here because if you do trigger something through AV, EDR, or whatever the, the detection mechanisms are that your, your laptop has or the solutions you have, uh, there'd be data to investigate when I remote in. I mean, obviously I'm remote into a lot of our client stuff right now and uh, we have to you know SSH in and we have to do a remote control to people's desktops um, I got to have the data it's got to be enabled so I would say regardless that's something you have to do across the board whether you're inside the organization or outside if you're outside the organization organization and you do rely for example SecureWorks as an enterprise solution um, it expects the traffic that you see within the enterprise going out the pipes to be detected. Well, the minute laptops leave the building, uh, a SecureWorks IPS IDS becomes worthless. Um, and there's not an easy way to uh, turn that on to the outside the enterprise unless you force VPN tunnels on login. Um, and so that would be another option for us remote people is to force VPN logins in these kinds of conditions where we're having a workforce working a lot remotely that when you log into the box, it opens up a tunnel. There is no split tunnel option. You're forced to go into the enterprise and through that network infrastructure that normally without it, you would be just surfing your home ISP pipe. Um, that does cause issues with printing, um, et cetera. Um, but yeah, you could potentially uh, open up the rules for USB locking if you locked the USB in the enterprise maybe you got to open up uh, because you've locked down VPN and you're forcing people to go VPN I got to get the documents off and print them uh, whatnot um, and so you got to give those sort of things some thought but there are definitely ability to do that right you can put stuff on the internet open it up do trust lists of IP addresses uh, you know or country say I'm gonna trust us uh, that there's a warning there uh, one of the biggest attackers of of gaming was US server hosting companies. It's one of my biggest gripes I have about threat intel organizations is they do not have a categorization of IP addresses that are server hosting companies. Meaning if I'm getting my game or my application attacked, it's from the US, it's probably okay. But is it a server hosting company where the foreigners will jump over to buy this cheap stuff and then attack us from there? Um, making it look like it's in our own backyard, therefore not the bad guy when it really is the bad guy using cheap resources readily available in the US. So you do have to take that into account if you say block all countries and just allow US, there are definitely attackers from within the US. Commodity malware attacks often use compromised Amazon web services, right? So that's US based. Um, so you do have to look at pos uh, potentially whitelisting people's home IPs. Okay, we've got an extended visit at home here. Everybody needs to go do a who is my IP. They need to send this in to us by Monday, we're gonna build a whitelist and everybody else gets blocked. And if you have, if you have an alternating uh, IP address because of your ISP just does that, then fine, give me the CIDR. We'll do a CIDR on that whole ISP range. You still reduce the probability of the attack vector because now they can't hit you from anywhere. They have to go and attack a box within that CIDR that you're allowing in your organization. So those are some things you can definitely do uh, as remote workers to enable your environment. That's awesome a good question. question. Actually. Awesome response. 
yeah, there's so many changes with remote work that all these tools that were totally in, interior now are being yeah. exposed because of this. Yeah. And we're discovering a lot of, I mean, from my organization, we're discovering a lot of tools that are, yeah, they have an external presence-ish type thing, but it wasn't exactly something they sold us on. <laughs> yeah, nor do people enable it. We had Big Fix. Yeah. We did not know it had an internet gateway until we opted to use it. Uh, Splunk, same thing. We didn't use it until we realized we could. And then the question became, how do we lock that down? And then the mm -hmm. VPN was the obvious choice. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that I think uh, there's a lot of security tools, especially any, any of your security tools that are within the enterprise that are designed to work within the enterprise are and that's, you know, web proxies. I surf at home now. I don't have a web proxy. Ah, well, force the VPN to go in and you're still using the web proxy, blocking all those domains you don't want to get to. So yeah, I do think this has increased a lot of SMB's exposure to uh, COVID situations where they used to be in the office and now when they go home, they've got no protections whatsoever. They have their admins on their laptops. They no longer have a web proxy, open DNS, email protections. Um, yeah, I, I can see why ransomware is on the increase in that scenario, uh, because a lot of the stuff I didn't talk about is not done in the SMB space and really should be free, free, free and significant reduction in attack service. And any more questions? Actually, Bill is putting stuff in the chat or he had things about that. He was the asking about the home based stuff. So that's a great question. I'll follow up with you again later. Yeah, that was a great question. Otherwise, we are a few minutes past. We can just wrap this up and we will be, OWASP chapter will be back at the end of next month with, I am not sure who, but we will have somebody. And if you're not aware, OWASP does have a calendar of events and activities that they're trying to broadcast more to the chapters that will try to put their stuff on there like this one. But it, all the other ones, since uh, many of the other chapters are now virtual too, you can probably try to attend those if you have other cycles you'd like to do. They are different times, different dates, and different activities, but they're still very, very informative. So once again, thank you, Michael. Thanks for doing this. All right, anytime. And uh, hope to see you guys soon at a social or con somewhere in person where we can uh, chat and, and go get back to some new normal. Me too. I've already fixed the presentation, so we're, we're good there. And that's Thank wrap. You. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.